Hi everyone, welcome to our talk, Hacking the Supply Chain, about the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities that halt hundreds of millions of critical devices. A little bit about us, JSOF. So JSOF is a software security consultancy. We do a lot of security research, penetration testing. Uh, we help companies with their secure development processes, as well as some training. My name is Shlomi Oberman, I'm a co-founder at JSOF. Together with me today, we'll be speaking Moshe Kohl, a security researcher at JSOF and the finder of the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities, and Ariel Sean, a security researcher at JSOF that was also heavily involved in the research. We'll be talking about Ripple 20 in general today, uh, explaining what it is uh, and how it evolved. Then we'll be going into detail about one of the vulnerabilities, the vulnerability that we find uh, the most interesting out of the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities. Uh, short spoiler here, it's one CVE, but we'll actually be talking about several vulnerabilities hiding behind this uh, one CVE. Uh, and then we'll be going in depth into exploitation on a specific vulnerable device um, with a specific configuration. So what is Ripple 20? Ripple 20 is a series of 19 zero day vulnerabilities in a TCP IP stack called Trek TCP IP. Uh, we say 19 zero day vulnerabilities, but it sort of depends how you count. There are quite a few uh, more uh, discrete bugs uh, in these 19 vulnerabilities, and two of the vulnerabilities were reported anonymously at the same time as we reported, so depends how you count. These vulnerabilities were amplified by the supply chain to affect hundreds of millions of devices in all kinds of verticals. Uh, medical, a lot of critical devices, industrial control, enterprise, uh, and a bunch of others. We'll explain how this came to happen. Out of the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities, four of the vulnerabilities are critical remote code execution vulnerabilities. And an additional eight vulnerabilities, or eight CVEs, are medium to high severity vulnerabilities, some of which could also potentially lead uh, to remote code execution um, pending further uh, research, uh, if anyone wants to go into that. Um, the vulnerabilities affect hundreds of different of million devices uh, from brand names you all know. Um, we currently have over 100 uh, different vendors with suspected affected devices, meaning uh, the different vendors are looking into these devices to see if, whether they're affected or not. Uh, these include uh, Fortune 500, Global 500 companies, such as those uh, you see on the slide, as well as one person, specialty shops, um, and uh, quite a large range and diverse range of uh, vendors. Um, you can see the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities in medical devices, when you go to the hospital, uh, in your home, in your uh, company, um, when you turn on the light, when you turn on the water, um, transportation devices are affected by Ripple 20. Pretty much everywhere you go, you'll see IoT devices in general, as well as specifically devices affected by the Ripple 20 vulnerabilities. Um, our current assumption, based on what we know, uh, the suspected devices, as well as the confirmed devices, uh, meaning uh, the different vendors confirmed uh, the devices are affected, uh, we assume every medium to large organization in the US has at least one vulnerable device. Of course, some uh, networks have many more devices, uh, such as data centers or utility companies, uh, but even uh, any other kind of organization might have an affected printer. Um, a hospital might have affected uh, IV pumps, etc. How did this come to happen? So this happened because of the supply chain uh, and security in the supply chain. Not in the sense that somebody put a backdoor into uh, a component uh, built in another country, but in the sense that a piece of code, a library, uh, had a vulnerability, like any software has vulnerability. And this piece of code was sold to an operating system. It was then sold onwards to a system on module, and the system on module embedded the operating system with our vulnerable library. And from this point, uh, nobody even knows they're using this piece of code, this piece of track TCP IP stack. Uh, this system on module is then used in different devices, such as IV pumps, and the whole uh, chain becomes vulnerable. Just imagine what happens if one of the companies along the way uh, goes bankrupt or ceases operation, uh, just how difficult it is to track down the vulnerable devices and how complex it is to uh, fix and patch. And so you have a, a network of devices, a network of different vendors, each selling to each other to create final products, uh, built like Lego as, from different pieces and different parts. And then when one part at the very beginning of the supply chain um, sort of strategically located at the beginning of the supply chain, gets affected by a vulnerability, different devices along the supply chain get affected. This is what happened with Ripple 20, and this is why it affects so many devices. 
So, why did we uh, choose to uh, do this research on cracked TCP IP and why we think it's important for the security industry as a whole? Well, for starters, this, this aspect of the supply chain of vulnerabilities uh, existing in the supply chain, not as backdoors, but just as regular vulnerabilities and traveling, rippling um, from device to device in this ripple effect, this is something that is mostly unexplored. It's been discussed, we've seen some examples, um, but Ripple 20 is really a prime example of what happens um, when a vulnerability is located this deep in the supply chain and exists for so many years. So there's one vulnerability, multiple products, huge impact, um, and, and this is quite the beginning of a discussion of what should be done to, to fix these types of vulnerabilities. Um, another interesting thing is, um, for us, it was, of course, a good attack surface, and going forward, um, there's the potential for zombie vulnerabilities. Do zombie vulnerabilities, uh, these type of, it's complicated vulnerabilities, we don't know if they're one days, we don't know if they're zero days. Uh, quite a few of the vendors, we believe, won't be patching. Um, either they'll, they don't know they have TREK, or the devices can't be patched, companies went bankrupt, and so you have these uh, walking dead vulnerabilities that are supposed to be patched. They've already been uh, reported, but uh, they still exist in the wild. So this is quite an interesting phenomenon, both for us as well as for the industry. Um, TREK specifically um, was chosen because it's an extremely successful TCP IP stack uh, used widely uh, in the embedded uh, uh, device world, in the IoT world, and has been available for over 20 years. So during those 20 years, or 20 something years, uh, it spread throughout the supply chain uh, from device to device, from vendor to vendor, and reached uh, its current, uh, current uh, scope, current impact. Uh, one thing that's very interesting about Trek TCP IP uh, made our uh, life quite challenging and makes the lives of network operators challenging is that the Trek stack is extremely configurable. So every instance of Trek uh, is slightly different. It depends when the vendor stopped uh, support of Trek, what version of Trek they're using. It also depends how they compile Trek. Uh, com uh, specific configuration options, specific features they bought or did not bought, uh, how they're using, what memory manager they're using, etc. And so uh, every version of the Trek looks uh, track stack looks different, uh, and the vulnerabilities change. So some vulnerabilities affect different devices differently. Some devices are affected by some of the vulnerabilities. Some devices are affected by uh, more extreme versions of the vulnerabilities, but the others are, are affected by lesser versions. So uh, very complex, very complex to understand. And of course, at the very, very beginning of a long supply chain. So Trek doesn't incorporate any other components, uh, which is not, not something that we can say about any of the other uh, devices affected, which all incorporate different components, including Trek. Um, the research itself, because Trek is so configurable, um, we had to take a few data points. We used six different devices. Uh, we spent uh, a differing time, a different amount of time on each device. Um, in order to understand what we're dealing with, in order to find variations of the vulnerabilities, uh, in order to understand whether certain vendors made changes of their own to the stack or to the compilation. Uh, and so we use six different devices um, with differing architectures um, in order to uh, understand what's going on, uh, where this stack is, how this stack use, is used. Uh, the research uh, took approximately nine months with changing uh, differing intensities throughout this time. Started September 19th, uh, we reported the vulnerabilities June 20th, uh, June uh, 2020, of course. Um, and then we discovered some things uh, after the fact as well. Um, for example, while trying to uh, bypass our company firewall in order to see if the vulnerabilities route over the internet, um, we discovered that um, because Trek TCP IP stack allows for encapsulation, um, you could also encapsulate uh, these vulnerabilities attempting to bypass firewalls. Um, so we, we were able to bypass our firewalls and at least some of these vulnerabilities uh, will write, route over the internet. Um, as with any research uh, involved in IoT, especially with so many different devices, we saw some pretty strange architectures, pretty strange uh, firmware um, firmwares and uh, firmware structures. Um, the device we'll be talking about today has one of these uh, unique architectures. Uh, we can't talk about everything uh, in the scope of 45 minutes. Of course, these are uh, very complex, detailed uh, 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 things. The exploitation of all the vulnerabilities um, is something that we won't be able to go into in depth. 
Um, we did release two uh, white papers with full details as well as pseudocode um, and specific uh, references to the devices and the memory uh, configurations uh, that we exploited. Uh, feel free to uh, look them up on our site uh, if you want to go into further technical detail. Um, a little bit about the vulnerability or the CVE that we'll be talking about today. So uh, CV 2020-11901 is a critical vulnerability in the uh, Trek DNS resolver component, so a client-side DNS vulnerability. Once it's successfully exploited, it allows remote code execution, um, as uh, we've demonstrated and as you'll see today. Uh, the reason we think it's so interesting and the reason we chose to talk about it, besides being uh, remote code execution, is the fact that DNS traverses NAT boundaries. So um, a device within your network will issue a DNS request which will potentially travel over the internet, allowing sophisticated high-end attackers uh, to perform an attack from outside the network into the network itself, um, which is different from most vulnerabilities we see in TCP IP stacks. Behind the scenes, four vulnerabilities. Uh, one, uh, what we call an artifact, so that's a bug that made it easier for us to exploit. Um, and these vulnerabilities vary um, over time. So along the years, uh, Trek changed these, uh, the stack and the vulnerabilities changed. So we see different versions of the vulnerabilities uh, in different devices, depending on when they stopped using Trek. Uh, they also change between vendor uh, configuration. One of the interesting things that we realized uh, during this research and um, uh, as well as during the uh, disclosure process, we realized that uh, the supply chain complexities are a real problem for information security. They're a real problem for the vendors. They're a real problem for the network operators and they create a challenge uh, for the whole industry. And uh, we realized this is bound to happen again. Right? We didn't research the whole TCP IP stacks. There are other TCP IP stacks. There are other um, pieces of code libraries that exist in the supply chains that have been lurking around uh, for years. And so uh, this would also be the beginning of a conversation about what the vendors and what the network operators can do to both reduce the impact of vulnerabilities like this uh, when they happen using things like exploit mitigations, as well as how um, we perform such complex disclosures and how uh, we make sure that as, as vendors, how the vendors make sure that their uh, suppliers are performing secure development, pen testing their code, uh, etc. So this is a, sort of a wake up call to some of the vendors and some of the network operators um, that this will happen probably again and again and uh, this can be prevented, or at least the impact can be reduced using uh, the right techniques. Um, now I'm going to hand over the microphone to Moshe Kohl. We'll be talking about the different vulnerabilities, where they are in the code, uh, and what they look like. Uh, thanks, Lomi. Hi, I'm Moshe. I'm security researcher at, at JSOF, uh, and I will uh, talk about the vulnerabilities that comprise CV 2020-11901, also known as the DNS bugs. So first we need to refresh our memory about the, the DNS protocol. So DNS is a core internet protocol uh, designed to map between domain names and IP addresses. It's a query response protocol uh, client server architecture. So the client resolves the name by issuing a query to a DNS server. Uh, so for example, if you browse uh, to www.example.com, your uh, browser issues a DNS query of type A to one of the configured DNS uh, servers and the servers look up the name and return the response. Uh, in this case of type A, the value of the response is an IPv4 uh, address. So a little bit about the uh, record types. So DNS servers can uh, return multiple answers in the same DNS response. An answer is specified as a resource record. Each resource record is associated with a name. We'll talk about the type and class fields uh, shortly. Uh, the TTL field specifies the number of seconds uh, this record is valid. The value of the record is specified in the R data uh, field, uh, whose length is specified in the RD length uh, field. So both questions and answers have a type in the DNS protocol. Some of the common types include type A, which specifies an IPv address for the query domain, type C name, which defines an alias, a canonical name for, for the query domain. Uh, this provides a level of indirection and type MX, which uh, defines the domain name of a mail server for the query domain. So if, for example, you send an uh, email for uh, gmail.com, your mail client issues a DNS query uh, for gmail.com, it gets back a domain name of a mail server for gmail.com, 
And because this is a name and not an IP address, this name needs to be resolved further into an IP address. So uh, the resolver uh, uh, issues a DNS query of type A in this case in order to resolve the, the domain name of a mail server. Uh, in practice, most DNS uh, servers simply hand in the IP address along with the name, but uh, nonetheless, this functionality need to be supported by the DNS resolvers. So, a little bit about the domain names encoding, uh, the binary format. Uh, so, domain names are encoded uh, as a sequence of labels. So, www is a label, example is a label. Each label is preceded by a length byte, specifying the number of characters this label occupies. And the uh, domain name is terminated by a zero length byte. And according to the RFC, there is a, a maximum uh, label length, is 63. This will come up later. So what the designers of the DNS protocol uh, noticed is that there is a lot of repetition in the, inside the DNS uh, packet itself. So uh, in effort to reduce the size of the DNS messages, they employ a simple compression scheme. In this scheme, compression is achieved by replacing a sequence of labels with a pointer to prior occurrence of the same sequence. So here you can see a sample DNS response packet. You can see gmail.com is specified as an offset uh, hex C from the start of the packet. And it so happens that gmail.com needs to be specified uh, multiple times inside the, the packet. So instead of specifying gmail.com literally in the packet, again, we simply use the, the compression features. We point to the previous occurrence of uh, gmail.com. So if we want to, to write uh, smtp.gmail.com, we need to write only the first label literally, smtp in this case, and the next two labels are specified using the compression offset. So uh, in the compression schemes, compression pointers are encoded in two bytes. The first byte begins with 1-1 one, one as the most significant bits, and the other 14 bits specify an offset from the start of the header. So uh, as Shlomi said, the vulnerabilities reside in the DNS uh, resolver of track TCP IP, and we find them in the DNS parsing logic uh, in the stack, specifically in a function called tfdns callback. Here you can see a, a snippet of a pseudocode from uh, this function, specifically the, the parsing logic uh, handling uh, MX resource records. So what we can see here is that uh, uh, the function computes the length of the MX host name, Based on that length, a buffer on the heap is allocated, and then the MX uh, hostname is copied as ASCII into the just allocated uh, buffer. So what we can see from uh, this snippet is that uh, TFDNS label to ASCII, the function that is responsible for the copy, is not uh, aware of the length of the buffer being allocated. What it does is simply copies bytes from the encoded name until a null byte is reached. So this means that if for some reason expand label length uh, returns a length value which is too small, uh, we will have a heap-based buffer overflow vulnerability. So this motivates us to look further into expand label length and examine its operation. So you can see a pseudocode of expand label length. What this function basically doing is sums up all the length bytes uh, while honoring compression. So in more detail, it reads the current label length then checks to see if there is compression or not. If there is no compression, which is the, the common case, it adds the current label length plus one to the total length variable, which is later returned from this function, and advance the input add. Uh, and if there is compression, it reads the compression offset, it computes a new label pointer based on that offset, and then it checks to see that the new label pointer points before the initial label pointer, so this means we can only jump backwards uh, from wh where we were. Uh, and the process uh, continues from uh, this new uh, label pointer. So as you can see, there is no bound checks on the packet buffer here. So this led us to the first vulnerability, a rate out of bounds vulnerability. Uh, this could result in a denial of service if, for example, while iterating over the length byte, we read from an unmapped page. Um, but more interestingly, uh, we can cause an information leakage vulnerability so uh, TFDNS label to ASCII, the function that does the copies, and has no bound checks either. This means that data from the heap could be interpreted as an MX host name. This MX host name is later resolved by the client uh, in an attempt to get an IP address. So this means that we can leak data from the heap inside the MX host name itself in the query. 
This vulnerability affects track version at least uh, 4.7, and it was fixed in later versions, as we will see. Uh, we don't know the exact version of the fix, but uh, nonetheless, the vulnerability still affects devices uh, in the wild. Uh, due to the complex uh, supply chain effect and the uh, nature of the embedded devices, so some d don't receive uh, updates. Um, so this is nice and all, but uh, we are looking for an RCE, so let's go back to the function that co computes the length and examine its operator further. So there are more issues with expand label length. So per, RF per the RFC, uh, there is a limitation on the maximum uh, domain name length. The limitation is uh, 255 characters, and this limitation is not enforced in uh, expand label length. Further, it does not validate uh, the characters of the domain name. They should be all alphanumeric and hyphen, but it doesn't validate it. So we can embed bytes within the name itself. And last but not least, the total length variable is stored as an unsigned short, 16 bits width. And uh, uh, recall that the total length is the variable that uh, is returned from the expand label length. So what, what we try to do is uh, we try to get our RCE by overflowing the total length variable. So what we need in order to pull this thing off is to construct a name whose length is uh, larger than 64K. So we ask ourselves, uh, is it really possible? Uh, this is not trivial. This, this is uh, possible over UDP. So can we overflow the, the total length variable within, within a single DNS response packet? Uh, the answer is yes, and we use the DNS compression feature to, to achieve this. The idea was to nest compression pointers within themselves. So recall that expand label length does not validate the bytes uh, of, the, of the domain name itself. This means we can embed uh, any bytes we want, and in this case, we, we chose to embed compression pointers. you see in the example shortly. Keep in mind during the examples that we have two challenges to, to overcome. First, there is a limitation on the DNS response packet size. The maximum size allowed over UDP by the network stack is uh, 1,460 bytes. And keep in mind that uh, we can only jump backwards from a current label pointer, so we will need to overcome this challenge also. So here you can see on the slide the basic construction we used. Uh, this is a name arranged in a matrix-like form. Each row in this matrix has uh, length 16. Uh, the bluish cells uh, uh, represent compression pointers, and the pink cells represent branch bytes. We talk about those shortly. So let's assume we're starting expanding the name from this offset, offset hex f in the first row. Uh, we can actually achieve this in practice by using another compression pointer that we, will land us exactly in that spot, but for now, take it as a given. So if we start expanding uh, from this offset, this byte is interpreted as a length byte. Uh, in this case, there is no compression, so uh, the function skips 0f plus uh, 1 bytes and moves to the next row. And uh, as well as it adding uh, 16 to the total length variable. The process continues. Uh, notice that we stay in the same column uh, because, the, because of the matrix, uh, sh special matrix shape until we reach a branch byte. And the purpose of the branch byte is simply to, to lead us to the next compression pointer. In this case, the branch byte is 0e, so we land in this compression pointer. We, we know that uh, this is a compression pointer because the high nibble is c. So what the function does is uh, uh, reads the compression offset. The, the compression offset in this case is 0e. It then checks to see that uh, we point backward from our initial position. So our initial position was hex f, so hex e is less than hex f. So we continue expanding the name from here. And the process continues. We reach a branch byte, we, we reach another uh, compression pointer. And you can see that uh, with this compression trick, uh, the total length variable nearly doubles itself. So if we continue until we reach a null byte, uh, in this uh, third example, we reach a total length value of uh, 1,500 uh, bytes which is pretty neat if you consider that the name itself only occupies 128 bit, uh, bytes. So, of course, this doesn't uh, uh, overflow the total length variable uh, yet, but uh, in order to overflow it, we use the maximum label length allowed, 63, x3f, uh, instead of xf uh, shown in the example. 
So using exactly this construction, we reach a name uh, uh, of length 64k. Uh, greater than 64k, that's overflowing the, the total length variable itself. And remember that if expand label length returns a value which is uh, too small, we have a heap-based buffer overflow, which is a good uh, RCE candidate. Uh, also know that this vulnerability can be triggered in response to every query type supported by the network stack by using CNAME uh, resource records, which must be parsed regardless of the uh, original query type. So this vulnerability affects the latest track version at the time of disclosure, and that's uh, considered uh, dangerous uh, from our point of view. So at this point, uh, we decided to purchase uh, another de device that runs track, in this case, another UPS device, and we want to, to know if the vulnerability affects him or not. And what we found is that Trek fixes the read out of bound vulnerability, but they fix it badly. So you can see that the RD length uh, uh, value from the resource record itself is checks against the remaining size of the packet. And now after the, the fix, expand label length accepts a third argument, label end pointer, which is, computes, uh, which is computed based on the RD length value. And what expand label length does when it reaches the, this end pointer, it simply stops processing without any error and returns the current total length. So this is perfect from an attacker standpoint because RD length is attacker controlled. So if, for example, we specify an RD length value which is uh, too small than the actual value, we will have uh, an e-based buffer overflow. Uh, so here you can see a resource record and instead of specifying an RD length value of 20, we, we will specify seven. So the label end pointer will point here Expand label length returns five in this case, but uh, TFDNS label to ASCII will copy the entire uh, MX host name, thus overflowing our buffer. So this is the second uh, heap-based uh, buffer overflow vulnerability we found. And uh, we also found during the MX parsing logic uh, a memory leak. We found that we can leak an other infrastructure. So here you can see an other infrastructure uh, is allocated. And in these two error flows, the other info is not freed. So this means we can leak uh, another infrastructure by specifying RD length value, which is strictly less than two, like one, or by causing uh, expand label length to return a zero length, uh, for example, by using a bad compression pointer. So the size of the leak is uh, hex 3C. Uh, and these uh, uh, artifacts come in handy when exploiting vulnerabilities. And in fact, we use the exact same uh, memory leak in our exploit, as, uh, as you will see later. So to summarize, we saw uh, three vulnerabilities uh, that comprise CV 2020-11-901 and uh, an artifact. So the first vulnerability, the readout of bounds, affects other versions of the, the network stack and was fixed in later version. The integer overflow vulnerabilities, as far as we've seen, affects uh, both old and versions uh, of the track TCP IP stack. And the bad RD length vulnerability is uh, a result of a bad fix for the read out of band vulnerability, and thus affects only newer version of the stack. The artifact uh, is present in both old and uh, newer versions of the stack. And the main takeaway from this part is that a device can be affected by one or more vulnerabilities, depending on the exact version of uh, track they're using. And this fragmentation uh, makes the life of the IT security personnel more challenging to know whether the devices are affected or not. So now I'll hand over the mic to Ariel Schoen. Uh, he will talk about exploitation. Thanks, Moshe. Hi, I'm Ariel. I'm also a security researcher at JSOF. And today I'm going to talk about exploiting uh, the vulnerability, the CVE, on a Schneider Electric UPS device. So a UPS device um, is basically a big battery. UPS stands for Uninterruptible Power Supply. And you connect devices to it uh, instead of directly to the wall, to the outlet, um, to protect them from power outages or uh, power fluctuations of any sort. Um, so we're going to exploit on a UPS made by Schneider Electric, specifically on the network card. Uh, this network card houses a Turbo, Turbo 186 uh, processor. It's an x86-based processor. Uh, all code runs in 16-bit real mode, and meaning also there are no modern mitigations at all, so no DEP, no SLR. Uh, this processor is x86-based. It's not strictly x86, 
as seen in this processor as a weird segmentation uh, scheme. Instead of shifting the segment register by four bits, like on x86, it does by eight bits. And we'll see this uh, feature come into play later. Uh, during this research, we had essentially no debugging capabilities. Um, so no JTAG, no GDB, nothing of the sort. Uh, so we relied mainly on static analysis and reverse engineering, uh, using only limited crash dumps uh, as assistance. These crash dumps uh, as visible feature a basic stack trace and some registers, uh, but nothing much. So just to recap the vulnerability. Our primitive is a heap overflow through DNS response parsing. Um, and this is a rather new Trek implementation. So uh, we can only overflow with alphanumeric characters and uh, hyphens and uh, periods. Um, and we're going to use the bad rd length uh, vulnerability variant uh, that Moshe talked about earlier. So when exploiting heap overflows, uh, generally there are two methods, either through metadata corruption so uh, overflowing uh, free list pointers, block sizes, uh, stuff of the sort, or by overflowing application-specific data structures uh, allocated on the heap. Generally, metadata is considered a more generic exploitation method as it doesn't rely on extensive shaping. And this is the explo exploitation method we used uh, in the earlier CVE on the DigiConnect device uh, that we, we have a right, white paper about this and you can find on our website. Um, and we wondered if you, we can use the same technique on this device as well. So the Trek heap, as implemented on the Schneider Electric QPS, uh, is slightly different. We have a free list that looks like this. It has a size field, uh, next pointer to the next free list block, some free data, uh, usually containing garbage if it's a free, freed block, and another post size field. So this heap features a tight fit preference. It will always allocate the smallest free block available for the allocation size requested. It also features free block coalescing. So there are never two adjacent free list blocks. Um, and it has all sorts of verifications and asserts that we didn't have in the previous heap implementation on the DG device. So for example, on every heap operation, the entire free list is checked. Uh, one of the checks is that the uh, first size field and the last size field uh, really do match. Um, allocated blocks, however, are only checked when freed, so this is a bit easier. Um, corrupting uh, the heap in a way that will not cause a premature crash due to these checks on heap operations using only alphanumeric characters is uh, rather hard, so we chose to go in a different way by overflowing data structures this time. Um, so we know we can overflow through all DNS response types. However, we chose to overflow through MX requests uh, specifically because when the device boots up, it will send out three MX requests. Um, so that is a good uh, exploitation uh, primitive. Um, also three requests is uh, very good for us for the uh, heap exploit since interactivity is always advantageous. It allows us uh, a bit more flexibility in shaping our heap exactly the way we want. And uh, we don't really mind that this happens only on device boot, as we probably would have to crash the device anyway. As said, we had limited debug debugging capabilities during this research, so not much insight into the heap and how it is uh, shaped. So we would like to get the heap into a state that is as deterministic as possible. Um, so crashing is good in this manner. And uh, crashing the UPS network card has uh, a very low penalty as it doesn't affect the actual UPS operation in any way. It doesn't affect uh, the power supply and the network card will automatically boot right up after a few seconds. So the penalty is very low. So overflowing data structures. Uh, we chose to overflow a structure called TSDNS cache entry. This structure holds uh, information about the DNS request response pair. Uh, it has all sorts of interesting fields. For example, the DNSC adder info PTR field that holds a list of adder info structs. Uh, these structs hold uh, information about a certain DNS response. So for example, if you resolve the name, this structure has a field that will hold a pointer to the name that was resolved. Um, other than that, it has other pointers and interesting fields such as the 
it's a doubly linked list, as you can see, so it has an X and previous entry pointers. And these are always interesting from an exploiter point of view. And this structure is referenced often in DNS response parsing, which is a logic we can easily trigger. So this was a natural candidate for us. So assuming we can overflow this structure, what can we do with it? This is a pseudocode snippet from uh, uh, the parsing logic. Uh, it specifically shows how CNAME records are parsed. Uh, so we can see that, first thing, a pointer is taken from the DNS uh, cache entry uh, into a stack variable. Then the CNAME is uh, allocated on the heap and the data is copied. This is, of course, data we control as we provide the DNS response. And subsequently, uh, the pointer to the new CNAME allocated on the heap is placed uh, into the, uh, what the stack variable points to. Again, this pointer was taken from the DNSC uh, cache entry. So if we overflow the cache entry, we can control to where this heap pointer to our CNAME is written to memory. This is a controlled pointer, right, essentially. We can write a four byte pointer to data we control on the heap in x86, 16 bit, this is a two bytes offset and two bytes segment. Uh, we can write this to any alphanumeric address as our overflow is alphanumeric. This is a relatively strong exploitation primitive. Writing data into places you're not supposed to write into is uh, always good when you try to exploit. So this is the primitive we chose to continue with. Our overflow is a simple heap overflow, uh, meaning it is from the end of our buffer uh, with no offset uh, into the next, uh, what, what lies in the heap next. So we would like, naturally, the cache entry to be placed after the MX name buffer. Because of the heap structure in this specific trick implementation, uh, we have all sorts of limitations. For example, uh, the cache entry is allocated on request creation. However, the MX name buffer is allocated on DNS response parsing. So chronologically, it is allocated later, and we want it on the heap to be allocated before, so we can overflow into the cache entry. Also, we, because free blocks are checked very often in this heap implementation for corruption, uh, we cannot write free data. We must overwrite only allocated data. It will be best if we can overflow directly into the structure without corrupting any heap data in the way. So we need to shape the heap in some way to get this to happen. Um, so a specific hole pattern uh, is preferable as we would like to overcome the chronological problem. We can do this because of type fit preference. So if we create, uh, for example, hole two as seen in this uh, diagram, uh, that is the size of the DNS cache entry structure. Uh, and before it, we have another hole the size of the MX name buffer we're going to allocate. Uh, we can overflow from the MX name buffer into the cache entry. Uh, we do need to separate them with some allocated separator uh, to prevent the two free blocks from being coalesced together and ruining our shape. So we need some allocation primitives to create this. We need an allocation to create holes and an allocation to create the separator. Um, so to create the holes, we can use a temporary, alloc temporary allocation primitive. Um, and this is relatively easy to achieve as every DNS answer uh, has all sorts of names in it, or we can cause it to have names in it. So either MX or PDR or C names, they all have name fields. And these names cause allocation on the heap. So the allocation is the size of the name we provide. And its data is, of course, alphanumeric and controlled. Um, this allocation will also cause a small adder info struct to be allocated as well. We need to take this into account when shaping. This allocation is freed when DNS parsing fails or when the record TTL expires. Um, so this allocation is perfect for creating free regions of arbitrary size, which is what we need. However, we need to separate our free regions, and we can do this using the adder info memory leak, the memory leak artifact Moshe talked about earlier. Um, and just to recap shortly, uh, we can see that an adder info structure is allocated, and only then uh, the record validity is checked. And if it's not valid, we will uh, exit through an error flow, uh, that will not free the allocation. So we basically have a memory leak uh, of a known size, and we can use this as a separator between our two free buffers. So we managed to shape the heap uh, into the specific shape we want, and this allows us to reliably overflow the DNS cache entry uh, every time. Um, so assuming we can do this, and we just showed we can, what can we do uh, with the CNAME uh, pointer override primitive? What can we overwrite? 
So this pointer right has all sorts of limitations. It's written to an address we overflow into the cache entry, so naturally only alphanumeric addresses are allowed. However, this is a string overflow uh, vulnerability after all. We're overflowing with the name, so we do have a trailing null byte. In uh, x86, uh, little endian architecture, this trailing null byte can be the most significant byte of the segment, allowing us a bit more flexibility in the addresses we can reach. Uh, however, nothing uh, in this specific uh, firmware is placed in a strictly alphanumeric memory address. So no code, no heap, no stack, no globals, nothing interesting we can overwrite. Luckily, due to the uh, weird segmentation of this Turbo uh, 186 processor, we can uh, use a little trick and easily combine two alphanumeric bytes to reach a non-alphanumeric byte or a non-alphanumeric segment. And this will look something like this. For example, we choose the segment to be null byte 4b, which is allowed. Uh, it will then be shifted by eight bytes and an alphanumeric offset will be added to it, resulting in a linear address containing a non-alphanumeric byte, uh, which corresponds directly to a non-alphanumeric segment. So using this uh, technique due to the weird segmentation feature, uh, we can reach uh, the heap utility code section, which has all sorts of functions such as uh, free and malloc, uh, which we can overflow. Again, this is a 16-bit real mode, so we don't have DEP or ASLR, allowing us to overwrite code with our primitive. So when overwriting uh, code in uh, x86, one of the interesting destinations to overwrite with the pointer is a far call opcode, as a far call has an absolute address encoded directly in it, uh, so if we can overwrite this uh, destination address with our pointer, we can uh, cause the execution flow to move into our CNAME buffer. So we can patch the far call using our primitive and execute our controlled payload. So we do this exactly. We, we patch a far call in a free airflow, uh, which is called when metadata corruption is detected. Naturally, we do corrupt the heap when overflowing, so this airflow will take place when our allocated blocks are freed. Uh, so let's shortly recap what we did here. First, we shape the heap in order to get the MX name buffer to be directly before the DNS cache entry with a separator in between that's not shown here. We then overflow to write the DNS -E adder info PTR to point into a far call in the free function. We then process a CNAME record. The parsing logic will process a CNAME record containing some evil alphanumeric payload. Uh, which will be allocated on the heap, and the pointer to this payload will be placed into the, the address we put in the DNSC adder info PTR, overwriting a far call destination, directing it to our evil payload, which can be, for example, some alphanumeric shellcode. Triggering this payload um, is uh, rather easy. The free error flow will be triggered when uh, the MX name record we overflowed from is free. And uh, the CNAME buffer, uh, specifically what we overflowed with, contains a two-stage alphanumeric shellcode, uh, which will decode itself uh, and allow us to run, essentially, arbitrary payloads, uh, achieving arbitrary payload execution. Uh, specifically, our payload just turns off power to all UPS outlets, turning off any critical device that was supposed to stay on. And uh, we will now see a short demo of this payload execution. Thanks for listening and tuning into our presentation. We'll be glad if you join us in the Q&A.